So we'll start our question and answer session, and I'll start the, the questions off right away with uh, Professor Brown. So actually on the news last night, everybody was watching, is uh, one of the most well-preserved woolly mammoths there's ever been, 40,000 years old, <clears throat> it's taking a tour through Asia right now. First stop is Hong Kong, and then it's going to Singapore and Taiwan. So how far back do you think you could go with this uh, technology to bring back animals that have been extinct? I think the, um, should I try? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the fantastic thing about the woolly mammoth is it's, it's, it's frozen, it's, it's um, preserved, and uh, it's been frozen and not thawed out, because if you, even if you take a piece of DNA in the lab uh, and you synthesize it and you freeze it and you thaw it, you freeze it again and you thaw it again, very quickly it shears, it breaks up, because the, the shear forces from freezing and thawing rip up pieces of DNA. And the great thing about this, uh, this type of animal, the woolly mammoth, is that it's been frozen and remained frozen for a huge amount of time. So it's all to do with preservation, I think. If it's been frozen long enough, you can do it, yeah. And evolving enzymes which work better on damaged DNA is something which people do now. So when you put these technologies, different technologies together, you can, you can do remarkable things. Yeah. Um, we'll take our next set of questions. I'll start with Korea. Is there any questions from our Korean colleagues? Yeah. Do you hear me? Okay, go ahead. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, here is my question. Um, <clears throat> I guess probing is similar to observing. I learned in physics that every material has the pro properties of wave. Also, I heard Heisenberg's uncertainty theory explain some difficulty in observing on, in microscopic view. I want to ask you, how did the kind of fact affected biological observing methods, or do you think that can work as a limitation in observing process? Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, how did the fact that every material has a pro properties of wave affected biological observing method? Um, sorry, I didn't quite understand your question. You, you're having your questions on the properties and effects of the bacterial system? No, not at all. Mm. <laughs> I, I think we're having, it's just that the, uh, the, the link isn't brilliant and it's a little bit unclear. Is it weight? Weight? Oh. Yeah. Uh, I will have a question first. Hello, my name is <laughs> Hello, my name is Lee Kum Young from Iwa Girls High School. Like many other students in my age, I have lots of uncertainty towards my future. I've always wanted to be a physician since I was young, but as of now, biochemistry is what I am into, and I'm considering changing my old dream. The thing I want to know is your motivation that leads you to who you are now. What do you think is the, what do you think made you to do what you do now? Question on innovation and motivation. Yeah. Um, so you you want to uh, study biochemistry, which I never yes, studied. Yes, definitely. So <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask. Uh, well, I mean. I guess one, one, of, one of the interesting thing of science is that um, you can jump across fields and especially, especially true nowadays is that you can really um, use your skills in chemistry, in biochemistry, use your skills in medical science for physics and vice versa, etc. So I think that um, what you want to do is to learn a you know, to be strong in one skill and then to be enthusiastic about research field and you just adapt your knowledge and your skills. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the way to look at your career nowadays, is to adapt to, uh, to uh, the new challenges and uh, to be inter interdisciplinary. Professor Norby, after uh, looking at the history of all these Nobel laureates, what do you see time and time again with these, uh, with these Nobel Prize winners? 
I think what, what history tells us is that, that you take one step and then you open up, I think you so open the one door and you see two new, new doors and you keep on opening this door and it, it's just expanding. Sometimes you hear this discussion about the end of science and haven't you really resolved the major issues? Not so. I think there's still uh, fantastic things to do to and we don't, since we cannot predict what, what we are to expect, we just have to run on our curiosity and, and, and uh, I really mean that to emphasize that to all the young people here. That's, these are exciting things ahead and the tools that we have today. Sometimes when I look back, the science we did in the early 1960s, you really wonder how we could make headway because we were so ignorant and, and still step by step but it, it evolved and, and all by a sudden everything became molecular and, and uh, we start to understand things in a much more refined way. Okay, um, questions from the students here in the audience? Oh, go ahead. Can we get him a microphone? <laughs> I'm sure he's a, a born again student. Hello? Okay. Um, I actually understood the question by the Korean student, so it's, it's in my field, and I'd like to uh, answer it. <laughs> so the student asks uh, very cleverly, I think, whether the wave nature, the wave particle duality nature of small particles plays some kind of role in biology. And I would also like to answer the question because this is in my field and that's what I do research for at MIT. And uh, the answer up until a few years ago was absolutely not. Biology is wet, warm, and noisy. There's nothing quantum about it. The answer since a few years ago is a resounding yes. At least in two fields for sure and maybe a third one and I think there's going to be a lot more. The, let's say the one that we are entirely certain that quantum physics plays a huge role is photosynthesis. We know that the efficiency of this process is uh, improved by a factor of four because of a large-scale superposition, which is an entirely quantum physical effect, does not exist in classical physics, large-scale superposition uh, between um, exotonic states uh, in the um, photosystem one, which is the molecule that organizes the chlorophyll molecules that absorb the light and generate the, the first step being generating a little bit of electricity to then generate CH bonds for the plant. So that is completely a quantum physical effect and it seems that nature and evolution has figured out how to use quantum physical effects at room temperature in noise environments to achieve a very practical effects such as uh, an improvement in the um, efficiency of, of, of photosynthesis. The other two uh, one of them is magnetoreception by birds and flies. Um, it's a quantum effect in how these animals orient themselves with the magnetic field of the Earth, not a classical effect. And the third one that we're particularly interested in, not quite sure yet, is uh, we think that olfaction may also have a quantum component in it in the way that uh, olfactory receptors, which are membrane proteins, recognize the um, uh, odorants that they bind to. So thanks so much for the Korean student who asked this brilliant Please go ahead. Here? Okay. Uh, actually, my, my question to Professor Tom Brown is uh, you mentioned about the evolution idea, the natural selection idea in the drug de design and de development, right? So that one is quite different from the traditional chemistry uh, reasoning, the logical reasoning ma manner. So actually I also noticed there's a combinational chemistry, the, the protein uh, synthesis machine and also the, some computer modeling program like the NAMD Gaussian or Autodoc, right? So do you think in that way the, the chemistry will just become a chem is tried and not the art of the, the molecule? That means uh, maybe one day the traditional chemist just be replaced by the uh, computer engineer who just coding to control the, synthet the synthesis machine. 
to do all the works, and there's no roles for the chemist in the future drug design and development. Oh, yeah. Um, is that... Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it would be wonderful if, um, if we could precisely design molecules by computer and we could synthesize them with 100% or even 10% um, uh, effect. Uh, the problem is that the bigger the molecules get, the further away from reality this becomes. Uh, of course, computers are w completely different today from what they were even five years ago. Uh, but we still need to understand in great detail the molecular interactions and how much they count against each other. So how much is a particular interaction worth compared to a different one, and there are so many different kinds of interactions, it's a multi-dimensional problem, and it's very difficult. So I think that, you know, ultimately, it should be possible to really improve computer-aided design of molecules with specific properties. Uh, and I'm sure that this is a field which will develop rapidly. It's interesting, though, that when chemists today um, try to rationalize the properties of molecules, they usually, almost always, do a lot of experiments and then try and verify the experiments by modeling and by uh, doing various calculations. What one point that I, I made in my talk was that when you have a very complicated system, even design by an individual person is not realistic because the problem is too complicated. So you allow an evolutionary process to occur or you, you create an evolutionary process in a test tube and drive that in a particular direction and select a molecule from many billions of molecules or millions of molecules to do the job that you want. And I think that in general, when you're trying to discover new things, you have to use whatever tool is available at the time that is a realistic tool to do the job. So I think that we're in an interesting time at the moment. Things that we can do now with biological systems are quite remarkable and are, and are in improving all the time. But I think that uh, the computer-aided design is also moving rapidly, but it's still, I would say, in a real... Um, it's difficult because I'm a, basically a chemist to do synthesis. I would say still in a, a fairly primitive state. But we should, we should respect it and we should encourage it and we should embrace it whenever we can. So uh, do you think how, to, how the young generation to prepare for the change in the, in the way we do the chemistry in the biomedicine study? I think whether you're... Um, by the way, um, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Southampton. You must, you must um, uh, come and knock on my door when you, when you come to Southampton and we can, we can have a chat, but you don't forget to do that. But uh, I was going to say, it doesn't matter whether you're 10 years old, 20 years old, or 100 years old, or whatever you are, I think you just keep an open mind and you, 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 be, you become interested in new things. Uh, don't, uh, the worst thing that anybody can do is to entrench themselves in a particular area of science and say this is my area and I'm an expert on this because as soon as you think you're an expert on something you become a dinosaur actually. Uh, you, you need to appreciate other people's views and see what's coming over the horizon. We, you should try and do that. So always be trying to you know, learn about new things not just inside your own area but, but way around it. Any further questions? Go ahead. Yes, uh, this is a question more directed to Professor Norby than anyone else. So, uh, now, just now you mentioned that the production of antibodies is a Darwinian process rather than a Lamarckian process, am I right? So, is that, is that so? Yeah, it's Darwinian. Yes, yes. So in that, so in that case, of course, that would mean that antibody produ production is not perfect. There are flaws. Anti antibody production only selects only selects what what works at the time. <laughs> Antibodies production only selects what works at the time, not what is absolutely best for defending against a particular antigen. In that case, which is why diseases such as influenza can come back time and time again. So in that case, what is the viability of artificially creating a perfect antibody of some kind, something that's able to completely detect a particular, vi a particular disease despite, all its muta despite any, any particular mutations, along with creating perhaps an artificial memory cell capable of 
of inducing a human to produce this antibody for as long as they live? Uh, I'm not sure I really got all of your question, but there is a lot of additional technology that I didn't mention about uh, that you can, in the laboratory, of course, improve upon antibodies, and you can play between different species, and so you can build up specificity in one species, and you can make it of the kind of way you can use in in man, and so forth. So, so, and uh, there are other. Uh, like the work in, at, 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 at the Scripps Research Institute where you can find enzymatic and new functions in antibodies. So here's a lot of cross fields. Mm -hmm. I see, but, I, see, but uh, I was asking if, is it, do you think it's possible with current technology to completely customize antibodies to be inserted into humans, to completely create new antibodies? Um, I don't think so. I mean, again, I, I would learn from nature and try to use, let, let nature do the work. I mean, the, uh, since all the clones are there, I mean, why should you try to design something? I, I, and I think you have to simply try to play the same game that's being used uh, in the normal evolutionary process. But such, but such a process is imperfect, which is why in diseases like, as I said, influenza can return time and time again because the antigens that they react to constantly change. So why not find a new process in order to vaccinate people completely against particular illnesses? Do you think such a possibility is, well, possible? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm, did you get it? I think I got, Jen, I can, maybe I can just, I, I, think, I, I think the question was, is it So, so I guess you're saying, can you have the perfect? Uh, yes. Can you have the? Yeah. Yes. Can you have the perfect antibody? Yeah. Can that, you create one that will also change itself to the changing antigen? Is that what you're thinking? So as the as the as the antigen changes, it will also change, because you know, as soon as you do that, you're going to have variation in the target molecule, right? Yes. So you have to have some way of um, the antibody would have to have a, a brain. It would have to change its shape to fit the change in shape of the molecule it's trying to attack. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it, if you could do that, yeah? yeah now, if you can think of a technology to do that, where you can have a dynamic antibody that sees the antigen and then changes its shape and then changes again and grabs it every time, uh, can you do that? <laughs> if we, if we were, if uh, but then, then, then we're back to the Lamarckian approach, I mean, the, 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 the key in lock pr process, and I think... With, uh, the, I think that's, that's not uh, the way to do it, because it, it, it is only by the evolutionary perspective. You can really get that. One more thing, of course, and remember when, when you talk about protection against uh, infectious diseases, they, these, the agents are, have, are quite, have quite a high rate of, of mutagenesis, and if you're just using the single antibody, they will simply quickly mutate and, and, and and, uh, and survive that attack. So, so in practi practice, when you, let's say, you can control a virus, you need to ha attack many different points. And it's like the same problem, you know, when you use drugs to prevent virus infections. These, these are all the sloppy enzyme system when they replicate a nucleic acid. So in contrast to our cells, which make a mistake of one million, they make a mistake of one in 10,000. And therefore, you cannot treat the virus infection by just the one drug. You need to have the three drugs, like we do in HIV AIDS, because then you multiply the possibilities for the agent to, uh, to mutate, to, to change. And uh, with 10 up to, to 9, it's much, much harder. I mean, so, uh, Again, the, if I got to your question, right, the engineering that specific magic bullet, I think that, that, that uh, Ehrlich talked about, it's probably not uh, uh, possible. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Can we had one more question, um, young lady in the back? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I just want to, uh, oh, okay, so I just want to comment about his question because I'm doing the engineering, the antibody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, 
according to his question, we, can you make the antibody really specific to only one target? We can do that, we can improve by doing the point mutation of the antibody. But the problem is virus is mutating continuously and also bacteria is mutating continuously. So even if you can find a good antibody, next time, because this is not perfect. I mean, the, the, that's the nature of the virus and small, uh, small uh, organism. So they are doing some, something wrong on their DNA and then doing some mistake, but it can be at the fatal things to us if it is the critical, critical region of the, this uh, uh, antigen. So, uh, and then we should find from the old uh, idea, old mechanism, we should find that some other places to uh, increase the affinity. Um, so, Engineering antibody is available, but it's a new era and new horizon uh, to uh, enhance. So that's very interesting part you can focus on in the future. And uh, the question to you, uh, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, big, uh, big gentlemen, um, <laughs> I originally from Korea, so I'm, I'm the like, um, kind of like a young scientist keep going on ahead for the antibody engineering. I came to know, and you can see there are some brilliant students in Korea, but they are not used in English, and even they are asking some good questions, but not easy to understand. So that's also what I experienced when I was young, and even like a young gentleman here, they are used in English, but they are using Singlish, so sometimes not easy to understand. So uh, what I want to suggest is, can you like uh, suggest not just uh, keep open mind on your like a uh, like uh, uh, the passion to the science? Is there any critical point you really really like uh, open your mind to the to science and really like uh, really start to like look for some certain areas? Maybe they need uh, some like uh, some tool or the methodology how really they can approach to the science and how they can really like. Um, uh, uh, deep into some somewhere, I think. It's, it's very ambiguous to them. I mean, the, it's really not easy. Oh, you can go to website and take a look at it. But if you take a look at the words they, uh, the, the scientists are using are not useful to them, not used to them. So I, I'm just asking you what can be a critical point to you, what was the critical point to you, and how you approach after that. I think your question is kind of ambiguous. Can you? <laughs> Can you kind of try to state it again? Yeah, so, okay. yeah. yeah. yeah I, mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, the language. Uh, you know, the, acoust the acoustics here are actually quite bad also. I think the language was no problem. Uh, we couldn't hear very well anyway, but uh, I understand your point. Um, I think we are often inspired by individual people. Um, and you're right, you're not going to be so much inspired by words on a, on a computer screen as much as you will be by contact with individual people uh, who, are, who are by their own nature inspirational. And just speaking for myself, I, I, we had some, we had a particularly inspirational chemistry teacher at school and that person had a tremendous influence on the whole year actually. And so many people in our school followed chemistry as a career because of one person. So, I mean, Okay, words and facts and you know, learning is important, but somehow it's the contact with people and, uh, that, that makes the difference, I think. That was, that was my experience, actually. Yeah. Okay, let me take one last question. Um, testing. Hello, my name is Zoe from... My name is Zoe from Catholic Junior College. Uh, this is directed to Professor Norby. Uh, you talked about immune systems, and uh, and there's been a lot of, of talk about treatment of cancer. So, but I've also read that like maybe we should look at the cause of cancer. So, um, also yeah, I read that cancer is caused by like the immune system having nothing to do, so it produces cancer cells. Can you shed some light on what I've read? So, so again, you, you want to discuss the, the the cause of cancer and what one can do to approach that. Right? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, I guess a lot of people here are much more qualified than I to, to, to answer that. So, so cancer is, of course, really a genetic disease, and it's due to, to usually multiple damage to the genetic material, and, and it's unique to each patient. These are kind of fundamentals in this. And you're looking for common denominators and see if there are some 
of that, and there's a lot of work being done on that. But in terms of returns so far, there have been uh, incidental pro progression in, in the advance of cancer research, but overall we're still waiting for uh, more specific treatment. Most of it is symptomatic, most of it is, is uh, relating to what the cancer does to you in, in the body. But this is a typical field where you can gain um, more knowledge with all the technique that we have today, and um, I'm sure there will be new breakthrough. But the important thing is that it's not, uh, you can't talk about the riddle of cancer or something like that. It, it's a very much diverse field, and the only common denominator is that these are cells that no longer respond to the, the signals that, that which you should obey in order to be under a controlled fashion when you replicate in the body. Is that some kind of answer to what, what you asked? This is going to end the immune system. No. Does it not? So it doesn't have anything to do with the immune system. As in. Okay, uh, well that, that's an important one. That has been considered for a long, long time and one has uh, really um, tried a lot of different approaches. I don't know where the field stands right now, but I know that the, the, the situation where one made some progress is when you take the cells from the patient, him or herself, try to educate them in vitro, in the laboratory, with selecting some of the antigens from from the cancer and then put them back into the patient again. I think that is what's, what's most hopeful in this, uh, this uh, field. Whereas a more general cancer vaccine, I think because of the, the diversity I was talking about, I don't think there's much hope for that. But possibly uh, it is important for the individual. Actually, there is a study in which when I looked at the, the frequency of cancers in people that have been on immunosuppression, that give you some idea about what is a normal control mechanism that, that we have in our body. And um, I know Harald Sulhausen in his Nobel lecture cited this, and what you find is that, that in the immunosuppression, some cancers, they clearly increase in rate, others actually decrease. So, but in those where, where it really uh, the increase in rate, then you could be more hopeful that you can use immunological tools, I think, to control the cancer because that is the way it operates on a normal condition. So again, it's an example of where you maybe can learn from nature to see how, how, how it operates under the normal conditions. I hope that gives some response to you. Thank you for your question. Okay, one more question. I think our speakers are getting hungry. Hello. Um, maybe I would just like to add, um, comment on the point that the girl has brought up, brought about. Um, I have done some research, although I don't really call myself a scientist, but I was thinking that maybe some of the immune cells play a role in fighting cancer, or at least the initial stage of cancer. So for example, the natural killer cells, which is part of the immune, innate immune system that um, can play a role in uh, fighting the, let's say, we have, sh our, our group has shown that uh, DNA damage could induce um, uh, NKG2D ligands that are a ligand that's recognized by uh, natural killer cells and this might um, f somehow play a role in uh, cancer suppression. Yeah. And, and sometimes... Sorry, um, and I think I've also read in the literature that T cells might play roles in um, in somehow suppressing cancer. But then, cancer is a I guess it's a balance between how the cells mutate in causing cancer and how the immune system fights. So it's always a is a battle, and the outcome depends on I don't know. Sometimes the cancer cells win, sometimes the immune cells win. Yeah. Okay. One second. Just a, a comment, um, a little bit of like an analogy to immunology anyway, uh, that we, we've been talking today, we've been hearing a lot about uh, DNA sequencing. And cancer genomes have been sequenced, human cancer genomes have been sequenced, and there was a study, quite a recent study, where uh, the genome of a, a cancer cell from an, an unfortunate individual who was suffering from advanced lung cancer was sequenced, which contained 20,000 mutations. 
Yeah? Uh, and, you know, it's like uh, the, the, this disease is caused by, by smoking cigarettes. But you can imagine the, uh, the number of different populations of cells in that individual's body because the mutations are not linear, they're exponential. So all the time, new cells are being produced with enormous numbers of mutations, and they're all different. Uh, and as soon as you start to mutate DNA repair enzymes, then the whole thing gets out of control. So it's just a comment, really. A comment, first of all, that uh, lifestyle is important. I mean, we want to cure cancer, of course we do, but we want to prevent cancer also. And also that the situation rapidly becomes out of control uh, in these kinds of uh, diseases. But 20,000 mutations in, in one cell, it's enormous. Well, maybe a little comment that's not a and has not been addressed is that now there are a lot of research, there's a lot of research targeting metabolism because we know that if we stop feeding the cells, the cancer cells with what they like, they will die. And then you can, although there is the ge ge genetic is very compl complex, you can find some hallmark and say, well, you know, if I quit uh, giving this kind of substrate to the, the specific cells, uh, then they will automatically die and so on. So it's, it's a new field of research. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be important in the future. Just one follow-up to that question. When you're looking at these using your uh, NMR techniques, do you see differences in uh, the metabolism, the kinetics of these type of uh, cancer tissues? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, you, you, you see a lot of uh, different things. And there are uh, a, a few um, recent article uh, showing that actually the enzymes are mutated and that therefore they end up with uh, other products that what you would have normally in the normal metabolism. And I think again, this is, uh, this is a proof that, okay, you have a genetical modification of an enzyme and the enzyme you used to produce something else. And then you could upstream try to block so that you don't feed this pathway and you try to go back to a normal metabolism. I mean, that's... I think I might add also that in, in solid tumors, as they grow, they need a lot of infrastructure, blood vessels and so forth. So this is still another point of attack besides just the basic metabolism. And uh, there is a number of, uh, of drugs being tried right now uh, following that line of development. Okay, in front. How bad the uh, this NIH system? Those animals that are sitting on the HeLa cells, these things are uh, they're they're just not uh, a good thing to look at. They, they, they're fed something which is, makes TPNH or DPNA because they've got to fight like hell to keep the the ROS down, right? And they and they end up uh, mute. Well, they're fighting mutations out of control, although they can still do anything. And I can't imagine why people think those are interesting screens for cancer. In other words, stay away from those. That's what's Doc Mock's opinion. And he also doesn't believe in the oncogene being the main thing. He has some pretty strong opinions and interesting man. Uh, but I, I think those NIH screens are the last, are junk. That's what I think. After talking to him, and also it makes sense. Okay, if we can give our, our speakers one last round of applause and thank them for the questions and answers.